welcome you all for the final session for the Fanfic Summit, which is on uh, low carbon materials. So, I would like to welcome the following participants. The moderator, Mr. Nikhil Tamble from Energy Consortium. Uh, investors Christine Vincent from Shell Ventures, Samir Mehta from Chennai Angels, and the following startups are uh, Vaibhav Anand from Bambrook, Kritika Mutukrishnan from Green Sketch Consultants, and Namrata Ramanathan from Upcycle. All right, good evening, everyone. I uh, have been just told that we have uh, still to handle 30 minutes only, but we'll make the most of this. Uh, thanks for being patiently here for the last two days. Uh, I mean, it's good to see uh, all the different sessions happening over these two days. And when I thought of low carbon materials, I think it's fitting that we go last because everything else has not worked. That's why we have come to low carbon materials to do climate fix, right? Uh, see, in my opinion, low carbon materials is a broad area. So I, I'll just give uh, maybe a couple minutes of how I see it and then allow the investors to build on that story from their point of view because they're investing in this area. So they obviously know about, you know, which are, which are more relevant or which areas have gaps. And then we want to hear from the startups on uh, two major things, uh, the why is, I mean, this is a why session. So why you feel this is an area that's very close to you? Uh, and how did you get into this? Uh, I will manage the time. We've been roughly given four minutes each. I think we can manage with that. Uh, see, working at IIT Madras across variety of areas, the way we think of low carbon materials, uh, to me, it's like this. Everywhere we are talking of how can I reduce my carbon footprint. So if I look at anything where I'm talking about that, then that material has the potential to be replaced or to be, uh, you know, uh, upgraded or, or s uh, some alternate means found so that I can go to a low carbon material. It could be the same thing with a low carbon footprint or it could be something completely different. So it's, it's as simple as that thought. But what that does is uh, now I suddenly have a large problem because this is an unmanageable sector to handle because everything under the sun can become a low carbon material or an alternate to that, right? So I just thought of three, four uh, main things that I wanted to talk about. One is, one is buildings. Uh, we work a lot on buildings, uh, whether they're in commercial area, whether they're industrial buildings or anything in between. And often we get hung up a lot on the energy usage, the water usage, waste. We just talked of how to handle waste. But often it's the embodied energy of the materials that go into the construction, which is uh, a very tough animal to take care of. So that's that's a large area where if, we, if there are low carbon materials in this sector, it could revolutionize the way we are uh, building future buildings. Uh, then it's, of course, the fashion and retail industry. I mean, it's roti, kapda, makan. So I just talked of makan. So there is uh, kapda. And if there's a way of uh, making that industry a lot more uh, less reliant on any uh, carbon inefficient processes, that's going to be a welcome factor for us. And I think we have someone who will talk to us about that. Uh, lastly, if I think from a nation point of view, low carbon material to us also means indigenous. And I, I want to qualify that word indigenous. It did not necessarily mean only something that we have developed in the country. Yes, we have. But I think the why is more important. It, it should be affordable, therefore indigenous. So any low carbon alternate, if it is affordable and made in this country, it makes a lot of sense. The second is security. Uh, particularly on the energy side, we have a lot of challenges in terms of energy security as a nation. So if we can indigenously create these low carbon materials, manufacture them locally within this country, that's one more way of looking at, because then we are attacking the carbon footprint, not just of the material, but the manufacturing process, the transportation of it, and ultimately how it gets used as a product. Uh, largely, I think of low carbon materials as a back to the drawing board approach. So anything where there is material discovery uh, is of interest. We've had some sessions and speakers talking about AI yesterday. Uh, we also have uh, quantum computing. Uh, it cropped up yesterday. And these are areas where, uh, with the faculty members specifically at IIT Madras, we are investing time in can I discover new catalysts. Catalysts are required uh, for electrolyzers. They are required for energy storage batteries. Are there alternate methods for that? But how do we discover these new materials in a very fast way? So again, material discovery is a large uh, 
uh, area for us. And lastly, I will close with this is, is about lifestyle choices. So when we think of low carbon materials, I think there's also a angle of are we making the right lifestyle choices which are fundamental and uh, you know sustainable by themselves. Uh, so that's a context setting activity for me. As, I mean, as I said, it's, it's very broad. Uh, so let's now try to manage the next conversation with some specifics that we are doing. I want to first invite Christine, if you want to talk on how Shell is approaching this, why Shell is thinking about low carbon materials, and then tell us a bit more details about it. Thanks, Nikhil. And uh, good evening, everybody. Really, really pleased to be here. Um, and uh, thanks, Nikhil, also for the great intro. Um, right at Shell, uh, just to give you a quick intro about what the investment scenario looks at within Shell Ventures. We are essentially the CVC arm of the Shell Global, and um, we look at uh, various areas of the value chain of energy um, that uh, fits in strategically as well with uh, one of our various verticals at the corporate level, um, and we have verticals like mobility and uh, your uh, shell chemicals and shell fleet solutions, etc. So at an overall corporate level, we are working towards achieving certain net zero goals. And so the investments that are looked at from Shell Ventures are also essentially catering to achieving the decarbonization there, right? Where uh, investments in uh, uh, investments are concerned, we have more than 100 companies across the globe. Uh, we typically do 2 to 20 million in check sizes. Um, in hard technologies, like even low carbon materials for that, uh, for that matter, we sometimes do less than a million kind of checks, including follow-ons, we could go up to 70 million. Um, now coming specifically to this topic, um, we have uh, a vertical called Next, Gener Next Generation Breakthrough Research, wherein our in-house team constantly works on uh, developing new materials that, um, uh, you know, um, that are essentially carbon negative and are there to displace your highly CO2 intensive uh, materials out there. Um, specifically, because it's an oil and gas company, a lot of new materials related requirements come up in our oil and gas pipelines. So one of our investments in Netherlands, for instance, is a company called Strom, um, which displaces steel with uh, something called TCP, thermoplastic uh, composite pipes. Uh, it's in fact the first and world's leading producer of TCP. And uh, if you take it at different stages of the value chain, um, during the usage, it consumes um, 21 kgs of CO2 per meter, lesser than what steel would. At the manufacturing level, it would consume probably 30 kgs per meter less than uh, the traditional processes. And then again, uh, during transportation and installation, a lot more CO2 is again saved. Um, then we have a company called uh, Dexmat in the US that came out of the material sciences department of Rice University. So Shell has a carbon hub that works very closely with Rice University and that's how we um, you know, got, it, got acquainted with them. Um, and uh, Dexmat essentially has ultra high performance uh, um, material that is uh, derived from carbon nanotubes and that is called Galvon, which is something that they've invented. Um, this galvan can potentially displace a lot of materials, right? It could be steel, aluminum, copper, various different material, uh, metals out there. And uh, the life cycle analysis that we did at Shell uh, revealed that this various products that are there uh, through Dexmat can save more than three gigatons of uh, CO2 uh, per annum in the overall global economy. So that is the kind of companies that we look at at a technological forefront. Uh, strategically, again, uh, it fits in perfectly with our carbon value chain, uh, especially um, where you take, say, methane pyrolysis uh, technology-related research, then this sits in well with that. Um, and uh, 
yeah, I mean, as an investor, it's great when you have a very, very differentiated product, uh, but it should also be commercially, commercially viable, right? So your unit economics needs to make sense. Uh, Dexmat, for instance, had already commercialized and they had major customers like Bosch, and NASA, and Raytheon across your defense, automotive, and your aerospace industries. Um, so yeah, the, that's essentially the why part of uh, our investments. Where India is concerned, uh, we have seven companies in our portfolio. In fact, one of them came out of our IIT Madras. Uh, detect technologies that you'd all be aware of. And uh, we continue to work closely with uh, some of the teams at IIT Madras, especially ones that are headed by Professor Satya. Uh, we are in talks with a couple of companies, including um, Aerostro Velos. Um, I'm not sure if Pradeep is here still. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we see a lot of potential. It's no longer just a mobility market. A uh, lot of innovations are happening here across uh, previous power waste and then, of course, sustainable uh, materials across different industries and, uh, and also a lot of deep tech innovations happening. Um, so very, very keen to um, you know, invest further in this market. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hold that thought on some of the things you mentioned. I'm going to come back after we discuss with them. but. Let's hear another perspective. Samir, how do you see the low carbon materials? What is the space for you? Uh, so I mean, why do we get excited about the space is because obviously if you look at the greenhouse gas entire value chain, low carbon material represents 20% of the reducible emissions in that ecosystem. So in terms of size of the market, you definitely need low carbon materials to make a dent. Uh, quick context, we've had some hundred and something investments as a family office. We invest in funds, but we also do direct investments. And one of our star companies is uh, sitting there, one of the best entrepreneur teams we've worked with, uh, led by Dr. Shivram, is ProClean Technologies. That's an example of what we call a low carbon materials or low carbon technology with core IP. Uh, we have two in this low carbon thing. There's another one out of IIT Delhi uh, called uh, NanoClean. So, the type of companies we get excited about, let's be honest, and I represent three different groups, so I should be clear. The family office tends to write slightly bigger checks. Uh, we do a lot of work with the Chennai Angels and the McKinsey Angels, and they write much smaller checks, all the way from first check, which is seed. So folks like uh, ProClean and folks like Fourth Partner Energy, uh, Get My Parking, all took their first check from the Chennai Angels. Uh, and the reason why this works really well for us is actually when we invest in companies, we don't know what's going to click, right? Uh, and I think when I remember the first time uh, I was taking ProClean to the uh, rest of the entrepreneurs, most of them were tech entrepreneurs. So most actually didn't understand any of the chemistry. So if you're honest about it, what they needed is somebody to act as that universal translator or adapter that takes, this is actually a, uh, surfactants is a huge market and if you are able to substitute surfactants with an alternative technology, a biosurfactant base or an alternative to biosurfactant, then the potential for you to be a trillion dollar company is possible. Not a billion dollar, a trillion dollar. And just to give you scale about it, if you add the chemical uh, company, surfactant companies, their revenues, it's a couple trillion. So that's what we were trying to kind of like solve. And people were saying, ah, but it's tech. Let's go invest in something that's hap rapid linear scaling. So the, I think a couple of things. The first is when we look at companies, we understand that the uh, gestation period of success for low carbon materials is much longer, especially the deep tech stuff. So our holding in ProClean is 12 years so far. And half our investors are going to try and exit in the next round, but half are going to stay. And just to give you scale, we've managed to now attract uh, some of the top family offices around the country and the world to be co-investors, and that's one example. If we look at some of the other examples, we sold our stake in Fourth Partner directly to TPG, uh, and it was seed check, some bridge capital, and then full exit, right? So. Uh, I think finding, if I was an entrepreneur sitting in the audience, find the right investor. 
uh, where are the spaces to invest in that get excited? I think you said it absolutely right. Uh, look at building materials that go into the next generation of concrete, the next, is there an alternative to steel, aluminum, that comes from very low carbon basis, uh, all the way from life cycle. So if I look at the mining or extraction piece, the stuff you don't see uh, next door, all the way to the stuff that's right next to your uh, backyard. I think that matters, one, uh, that it has to be a full life cycle chain. I think the second piece that's uh, extremely critical in most of these technologies when we look at food is are there alternatives today to uh, things that take a high amount of water usage, uh, a high amount of alternative feedstock for an animals, for example. Uh, so animal feedstock is another huge opportunity where if you can substitute that out with some sort of uh, easier to use, maybe something from the waste ecosystem or something that's grown naturally that we currently consider waste or not useful. I think that has huge opportunity. Uh, and I think the third is obviously clothing, and I know one or two entrepreneurs are in the audience. There are, just think about colors and pigments, right? If you go and attack that one industry, paints, it's huge, right? Clothing, building materials, paints, Right? The amount of uh, substitution you can do around carbon is disproportionately high. We like the deep tech stuff. I'll be very honest, if you've got a circular thing which takes uh, product A and makes it slightly better, I don't think we're the right investor. Uh, I'll be a little bit transparent. But I think if you're looking at longer life cycle, you're looking at, I mean, I still remember, I think out of the first 100 uh, customers that some of our companies have, we probably introduced them to 50, right? The company still had to do 90% of the work to convince them why their technology was better, economically viable compared to peers. So they had to be cheaper, and that was one big insight Dr. Shivram said yesterday, that whatever we take in low carbon has to be economically viable as an alternative and not a premium. This concept of premium, I worked for Shell, Exxon, BP, and McKinsey for a long time in my former life. And I'll tell you, uh, when you, when we release premium fuels out, a lot of Americans didn't change their habits. They actually bought less fuel. And America is a great market to look at because it's actually a single market, whereas Europe is distributed, fragmented markets. India is also a fragmented market. So when you look at these ecosystems, you have to be competitive in the ecosystem to get uptake. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, aptly said, but I'll still paraphrase few words because I want to lead into the next question that I want to ask you. From both of them, uh, life cycle analysis, he mentioned directly, he mentioned LCA is important. Circularity is important with any new solution that comes. So let's not just try to offset. Let's try to make sure it's a circular uh, uh, solution. Uh, then of course we heard what an investor will say, but I'll still say it, that the size of the impact that you can create matters. Uh, to them, as well as the gestation period. Uh, and I mean, he said it loud, she said it. Uh, so how are your perspectives that I want to hear as I ask you the next question? So, but I do want, uh, I'll call your names out. I do want you to start with a why for, for your own company and tell us about what's the sustainability impact aspect of that that you can bring out and why that is a big challenge uh, or a big, uh, you know, solution from your point of view in no particular order, so don't hate me for doing this. But Kritika, do you want to start first? Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, nice hearing from you. Uh, hi, guys. My name is Kritika Muthakrishnan, and I run an organization called Green Sketch Consultants. Uh, I'm basically an architect, so it's about buildings and building materials, basically. Uh, we are a consulting company where we try to make the buildings green, uh, whether it's a new building which has been designed, we try to ad take the design, analyze it, and uh, add our sustainability inputs to it. And if it's an existing building, we analyze its current state of operations and see what better can we do is what we do. We started this organization about nine years back with the aim to make green simple. It's easy to say. It's a very simple tagline, but it was really hard for us to uh, as, uh, adapt to what it meant. It's very easy to be reductionist when it comes to sustainability. So we wanted to avoid that. And the construction industry right now, even if they do want to do things in a sustainable manner, 
because the construction industry uses so much materials and so much technologies it's very hard to take a decision on which is the one that is best suited for that that particular situation so to make that connection is where we come in and uh, to make that connection we use make use of some simulation technologies which helps us to identify especially we do uh, life cycle analysis for buildings where we see which is the better choice of materials when it comes to uh, building a building so one b material may make a different impact in a say a small office as compared to using that same material in an it office or using it in a hospital building or using it in a residential building so it's not the material as a standalone it's in what context is it applied that we need to see is something that we look at as part of our work of course we do work in energy water and waste management also but since this is a low carbon thing i'm just talking about it when we started this uh, thing uh, we also went with uh, there are certain rating agencies that are there in uh, india many of you might be familiar with it they are called igbc lead and all that so we adapted those as kind of the base framework because at the end of the day our clients like to have some nice shiny certificate that they can hang up and say that this is what we have done a green building sort of a thing but our core uh, business is to help our clients make better choices from a sustainability perspective coming specifically to materials the issues that we have seen right now is the first thing is the lack of information there are so many uh, materials there are so many choices that are available but the information on them is not <coughs> very easily available so uh, this is something which uh, f uh, we i had a discussion with mr sivaram also in one of the panels where i said that there is a glamour quotient also which is associated with building materials and all that and uh, that glamour quotient uh, if your product is glamorized then it finds uh, easier adaptability in buildings so we try to overcome that situation also and kind of be objective about it which is a little bit difficult because architecture end of the day is also about aesthetics so uh this is something that we have been passionately working on and uh, we have been uh, quite successful to be honest and uh, um we look forward to the future where uh, now the uh, concept of net zero and um, uh, net positive has now caught on where net zero energy has already become very popular it's now taking forward to net zero and materials also where we have to do the life cycle analysis and see the offsetting of the carbon uh, emissions of the materials that we use and all that uh, those are all some of the new things and with the advent of esg which is uh, environment social governance uh, this is now become more and more uh, required where everyone has to disclose uh, more data about what they are doing and uh, when it comes to a building which has maybe say 100 150 materials and all that this such kind of disclosure becomes really hard so there is much uh, opportunities in that field for maybe technology startups uh, or any other kind of startups there are so many ideas that can be looked at so thank you so much for your time Th thank you for summing up it very well uh, it was good to also hear that you the use of simulation tools and thanks for building on the lca part which you are saying Uh, but what i also like the fact that you you are not making sure that everything is not just a silver bullet it may depend on the size of the project that you are handling so very important aspect from a application point of view uh we going to come back to one of the things which you mentioned but i'll first allow the other speakers to go uh may i ask uh, namrata to go next namrata did this in 2 minutes so i'm giving double the time to her this time sure. you did it in 2 minutes if others don't know <laughs> as part of the competition upstairs yeah um so good evening everyone uh, i'm namrata i run this venture called upcycle uh, i've been listening to presentations and i've been uh, uh, you know part of this for the past two days and i realized that um, we are not very like exotic or we don't extract stuff from uh, you know and we do not uh, uh, talk about collagens and uh, you know uh, materials and stuff like that we solve a very 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 basic problem which is burning of fabric now um if you're going to see uh, i mean though it is not like openly visible 
uh, what happens to um, I, I mean um, I, I'll, I'll address a very very basic problem which is um, tailoring waste right what exactly happens to the tailoring waste it's actually a supply chain problem but um, if you're going to look at it uh, closely what uh, they do with it is it doesn't even end up in landfills. It doesn't go till there because the tailor doesn't have the money or resources to take it, put it in the uh, 1D or whatever he uses to go dump it in the landfills. Now, if he's going to dump it in the dustbin, somebody finds out, he gets fined. Um, if he has to make somebody to pick it up, he has to pay uh, someone to pick up that waste and put it as part of the, uh, you know, small battery driven cart that, uh, you know, GCC has provided, right? Now, um, that's where we stepped in and we said, okay, we will collect the waste, we will sort segregate wash. And we will see what what can be done with it. So we we didn't have a solution, uh, you know. When when I started off, I didn't have a solution. Um, but as I approached it, I also got paid uh, because uh, instead of paying that guy who is still going to go ahead and dump it in landfills. Um, uh, this tailor was very generous and he said, okay, ma, I will give you 50 rupees. You come and collect it like every day. So, uh, though that would have been an amazing uh, revenue model, uh, I thought, uh, why not do something else with it? What what happens to the conversion? Okay, there are a lot of people in waste management, waste collection, all right. What happens to the conversion, right? So, as I started looking at it, I realized it is not consistent waste. So when I said I wanted to do upcycling, I wanted to do up something about fabric waste, the first thing that everybody uh, you know, told me was, OK, look at Tirupur. The best part about Tirupur and where the cotton waste or basically consistent waste gets generated is the bulk uh, you know, portion of it. You can recycle it as is. You can convert it into cool. They basically call it cool. Uh, you can convert it into pieces and turn it into yarn, add a bit of polyester, and then create fabric again. But what happens to mixed waste is the problem that I wanted to solve. That's where you know, Upcycly uh, started off. We start, so um, even though upcycling has been around for a very long time, I mean, a very, very long time. I mean, I remember my grandmom uh, doing upcycling, uh, you know, and her, uh, you know, mom and everybody as well. I'm sure it has been in the family. Old t-shirts become, uh, you know, mops. So, um, but that's... Uh, so is are, are these materials good enough to become mops? That's That, that was another question I wanted to ask. And 90% of whatever we, have, we wear is polyester. And if you're going to step on polyester, make it match, you're going to you know, slide, right? It, it doesn't have the friction. So when there are so many problems at the very root level, I mean, very material level, why not make something out of it that uh, you know, a human uh, will be able to use uh, in a very stylish manner, at the same time, have a very long-lasting um, capability. Polyester doesn't tear that easily. Right. Um, thanks to the uh, little bit of petroleum, uh, you know, extraction, whatever is added as part of it. But um, uh, since it has that kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, capability, uh, why not make something that will actually last long, that will actually, uh, you know, need that uh, uh, longevity. And we realize, we realize that bags are the first, uh, you know, uh, thought that, that came into my mind. Uh, now, how exactly do we make bags out of this? So every single step, there were, um, uh, you know, okay, what next uh, was the question that I kept asking. And um, uh, my, my uh, the, the entire concept behind Upcycly was also that it, uh, it had the necessity to give employment to people. Now, uh, again, like I said, tailoring waste is being generated at every 500 meters uh, in Chennai. Right now, if I'm going to have a central unit where there are going to be waste coming from all over Chennai, I'm going to create more carbon footprint than um, you know, uh, you know, uh, offsetting it by driving the waste around. Is there a way to decentralize the entire process? And that's exactly what we have done. Upcycly now works uh, with women from marginalized communities. 
at regular uh, uh, you know uh, uh, places we have a small setup uh, by setup i mean all of our i mean we affectionately call them akkas all of the akkas work from home all of these are women from semi urban um, um, very low income groups who require uh, this particular income to say run the family uh, while having a lot of domestic abuse issues as well um we uh, identify them we give them training uh, we also support them in case they need uh, machines or you know motor for the machines machines where of course uh, uh, you know they they uh, got it as part of the uh, government uh, initiatives um, and uh, we give them training we help them identify the materials how do you sort based on the materials and now uh, we started off with one akka we have like 11 akkas working and um, uh, it works out of mover some petai there is a, a set of akkas working from kamarajapuram uh, we also successfully uh, delivered training online to uh, a couple of women in odisha and just before i left uh, for uh, uh, the sessions today i have received the samples as well i'm yet to open it up and see but uh, i'm sure they have done an amazing job so decentralization of waste is something that we are uh, you know we are focusing on we are also working with a lot of uh, mothers where they want to convert so as uh, as we started developing these kind of uh, uh, pieces these kind of bags we've been able to generate decent amount of revenue uh, now that because of which we've been able to bring uh, build our brand online uh, because of which we got a lot of eyeballs from mothers young mothers especially who want to upcycle their kids waste uh, their kids uh, clothing and say that hey see i am setting an example for you i am leaving a better world for you is something that they want to tell their kids and they are making like small small things out of it um that's where i have i mean I, we are working very closely with uh, ibm's uh, generative ai wherein um, they give us the uh, i mean the generative ai give, gives us the uh, output and that becomes the design input for us because when i tried explaining color palette to our akkas they didn't understand even i didn't understand what color palette the whole thing was and um, when uh, i'm sure when this this one is going to give us the output they just know what to put after what and it it is going to generate so much more employment we are going to uh, divert so much more waste um which actually amounts to uh, about 500 tons a uh, uh, year uh, i'm i'm talking about just the waste generated by uh, moms with their kids clothes so um yeah i'm sure we are in the right path i'm sure we will be able to crack a technology where this decentralized process also um has um, uh, you know adds more power to it and automates the entire process thereby giving uh, you know uh, more employment at the same time um adding to the whole uh, climate action that we are in thank you for addressing that why in uh, such a beautiful fashion and talking about the different layers uh, that you have thought behind your your startup uh, often we talk to large industries and they have a triple bottom line approach i think you have created your own in your own way so thank you for that uh, i'll move on to vibhav uh, to speak to us about you know how he has approached and what's the why for him um first of all uh, good evening everyone and thank you for having me here in the subsequent years as well i'll be very precise on why giving you the numbers uh, we consume 460 million tons of single use plastic today and uh, given by the data 91% of it doesn't get recycled today why is because the amount of energy required to recycle a single use plastic is more than the amount of energy required to create a virgin plastic that is the reason that nobody recycles a single use plastic so i am from bambru and uh, we develop alternates to single use plastic uh, for multiple verticals of the industries right from uh, fmcg pharmaceuticals uh, to your retails uh, e-commerce d2c and so on and so forth we have uh, applied for five patents one of them is a, uh, about to get granted and um, we develop low carbon materials so uh, we have offset more than 125000 of carbon emissions so far working along with all the major brands that you can name of today hul itc britannia big basket tatas 
Amazon, Flipkart, Mintra, Nike, all of them. And uh, recently, we have got into FMCG space where we are doing trials with HUL in Europe and multiple other regions. Amazon, we have been working not only in India, but at a global level, we have been working with them with uh, in s Middle East, uh, South Africa, Australia, Europe, Japan, all of these regions. And uh, fortunate enough to be working along with all of the major FMCG brands, ITC being one of them, we are very fortunate to be working along with them by replacing their Ashirwa data packaging, which you would have seen coming up in uh, all of these places. Uh, how? Uh, as I said, working on development of different kind of materials which could enact as plastic, being 100% uh, plastic free. Uh, would like to stress upon one thing. Uh, there's a lot of uh, camouflaging which happens in the market today under the name of compostability. A lot of people don't understand uh, the difference between home compostable and industrial compostable products. And they get a virtual sense or I would say a pseudo sense of using a right product by using or uh, using the industrial compostable products. Unfortunately, in India or any uh, developing nation or developed nation for that matter, do not have any industrial composting facility. So all of the products which are industrial compostable are as good as plastic today. It, it leaches out into your environment, into your human blood. You would see that a lot of microplastics have been found. So, yeah, um, we have recently set up our largest manufacturing facility, which is in Bangalore, and we operate across all the across India, working with all of them, and uh, we provide them an entire circular, uh, you know, solution where we do a life cycle analysis of how much carbon emissions that they are generating not only at the packaging level, but we are getting into much deeper uh, aspects as well, like how much of the oil that they are using in the transport section, what is the energy consumption that they are having at the uh, manufacturing level, and this is what we are going to provide to them and give them a solution. Maybe we are doing today only packaging. So provide them with how they can reduce their carbon emissions in packaging and how much would be the carbon emissions saved by uh, you know substituting their single-use plastics with the materials that we are developing for them. And uh, and uh, on, on, on top of it, we are also trying to give them uh, an um, understanding of the material, uh, where it came from, the traceability option as well. Right now, traceability is mostly found in your food and other places, but we are trying to implement in the packaging space as well. When it was harvested, where the, uh, you know, the paper is coming, whether it is coming from the right FSC resources or not or it is coming from the forest uh, place. So all of these information is what we are trying to provide to the customers in the long run. And uh, it's been good four year journey for us. And um, we have grown 10x year on year last 12 months. It's been 5x growth, uh, three and a half years that we have had so much. Uh, we have grown 50x in last three and a half years of time. Uh, not boasting about ourselves, but uh, uh, we are the largest in this segment today and uh, hopeful to be at an uh, international level very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, by extension, I want everyone to applaud all the three startups for doing what you are doing. <laughs> thank you for helping us in the low carbon material uh, arena. Uh, and I also want to thank both the investors for staying committed and you know staying invested in all the things that are happening. Uh, that brings me to the conclusion the format unfortunately or fortunately does not allow for Q&A on the stage. We can do that off the stage. Thank you so much for joining and there's probably a customary picture if you find a photographer. So.